Hello and welcome to the Oxfordshire Regional Final of Fame Lab. Everybody is here and hello um, from all of the contestants and all of the judges will be joining you tonight. My name is Rowena Fletcher Wood and I am going to be your compare for this evening. This is the second stage of this international competition in science communication. We had the Oxford local heats and now we are in the Oxfordshire regional final and following on from this we go to national and UK level. Uh, in this competition the competitors are eight brave competitors will have just three minutes to make you fall for the science, the maths, the medicine, the engineering, or the technology topic that inspires them so much. They're going to use every trick within their power to express, profess, and impress you in the FameLab process. They will be judged by our fantastic panel of four judges and I will be introducing them to you in a minute. First of all though, uh, this competition is hosted by the History of Science Museum in Oxford. I will be telling you a little bit about them later on, but I'm a firm believer that science was built by mavericks in basement laboratories. And in fact, when the History of Science Museum was originally established in 1683, um, it was designed so that natural philosophy experiments could be carried out in a basement chemistry lab. And that is exactly where we would be were this event held in person. So I would like you to close your eyes, go far away from your drab living room or bedroom, no judgment, and imagine that that is exactly where we are in the basement laboratory of the History of Science Museum. We would be surrounded by wooden framed glass cabinets. And later I will be taking you to virtually have a look at a few of the exhibits and talk you through some of the things that you might have seen were you in that room. Um, but for now, you haven't come here to hear me. Uh, you've come to see our wonderful competitors. So make sure you've got a drink in your hand. Make sure that you are ready and geared up because we're going to get a lot of science very fast. If you want to share your thoughts with us, you can tweet to us at HSM Oxford, at FameLab, hashtag FameLab, or if you want to talk to me at Rowena FW. Uh, please let us know your thoughts, tell us something interesting you learned from one of the talks, cheer on the contestants, or maybe share something that you are thinking about with science and science communication. If you want to let us know what you thought of the competition, there is um, an evaluation form, which I will be mentioning again a bit later on. So if you go down to the description box in the YouTube video, you can click on that and let us know whatever you think. And we will be keen to read that. Um, first, the rules of the competition. So for FameLab, there is no PowerPoint allowed not for the contestants anyway. I will show you some pictures from the History of Science Museum. Uh, there could be no pre-recorded content and props must be something that they could carry onto the stage. The talk must be different from the heats. We're going to leave it up to Zilka, who is our chair judge and who was also present in the heats to judge that their talks are sufficiently different. Um, but it's important that they don't just do um, a rehashed, new and improved version of the same talk, although their topics may be similar because a lot of the time they will talk about their research area. Each contestant has just three minutes and the time is going to start when they start speaking. When they get to the end of time, this will happen. <laughs> and that will let us know that they have finished. They can, of course, finish the sentence that they're on um, and tidy, tidy up uh, their conclusion. Um, but if they keep talking and talking, mm, 
that's going a bit far and I might start interrupting them or pressing mute because we have that power. They are then going to be cross-examined by our four judges on the three C's, content, clarity and charisma. And the judges will have two minutes to do that, but we're not timing the judges, so that's about two minutes. We'll trust them. Anyway, let's meet the judges. So our first judge is William James. He studies tis tissue microphages, including the microglia in the brain. Uh, these act as critical sentinels to defend us against infection. And he uses gene editing and modeling to dissect the molecular pathways involved in these processes. Um, and William is going to tell us a little bit about content. Um, and so content is probably the most trickiest uh, element that the contestants have got to deal with. They've got to balance up the almost impossible task of conveying accurately a scientific concept but in terms that are both appealing and meaningful to a lay audience without uh, exaggeration, without deviation, and uh, without uh, making things seem much simpler than they really are. So I think that's going to be a really uh, tough challenge for all of them, and we're going to be looking out for how well they do that. Thank you very much, William. I look forward to your judging of the contestants' content. Our second judge uh, for this evening is Sunitra Gupta. Uh, Sunitra studies the evolution of diversity in pathogens with particular reference to infectious disease agents responsible for malaria, influenza, and bacterial meningitis using mathematical models. She has an interest in the public understanding of science um, and also in the connections between um, science and literature. And Sunitra is going to tell us a bit about clarity. Hello there. Well, it goes without saying that clarity is uh, critical for effective science communication. Um, I think actually Williams mentioned some of the elements that need to be present because cl clarity and content are actually kind of interwoven at some level. But obviously the structure of the talk is important. Um, and also the accessibility of the material. So it has to be, the challenge here is to present sometimes very complex concepts in a way that the audience can follow and also that we can follow. So that's your challenge and I'm sure you'll all um, perform very well on that score. Looking forward to your talks. Very clearly put. Thank you very much, Sunitra. Okay, our third judge for this evening is Alexei Karanowska. Uh, Alexei is interested in the properties of magnetic systems at the quantum level. Her research focuses on spin wave systems and the application of radio frequency, microwave and optical physics to cultural heritage research and preservation. And she also runs an international public science program. And Alexei is going to tell us about charisma. Yeah, charisma. So like all good words, I guess, for, for tricky human qualities, we owe charisma to the Greeks. And in fact, in its original sense, charis, the word from which ours is derived, charisma, um, has the meaning of grace. Grace, in fact, in the sense of grace conferred by the gods. Now, we now use charisma to mean something that's a little bit broader and perhaps a bit less supernatural in origin. And that doesn't make it easier to define, but we do know it when we see it. And thinking back to grace, so the, the root of charisma, grace is a really interesting idea, I think, in the context of this evening's competition. It's a virtue that's simultaneously about physical perfection. So we talk about people, people things moving gracefully. And also a non-physical kind of perfection. So a sensibility, come what may, a person who's said to have grace knows what to do, what to say, how to behave, etc. And the world of science, the natural world, is absolutely full of grace and gracefulness, whether it's the motion of atoms and molecules, the dynamics of weather systems, the beating of the human heart, you name it, it is all incredibly graceful. 
And to do it justice, I think, in the context of a really good talk requires a little bit of that same quality, a touch of charisma on behalf of the presenter. And charisma in the context of giving a good talk, I think, is the art of making people want to listen to what you have to say. And perhaps even more than that, feel a kind of affinity with your outlook on whatever that is. So a charismatic speaker has the ability to, to educate and to inspire their audience without appearing to lecture them, um, is, a, is a kind of credible advocate for whatever point of view that they're trying to get across or whatever kind of idea that they're trying to convey. And crucially, irrespective of how big or how distant the, the audience is, makes you believe that they're speaking to you personally. So good luck, everyone. We're really looking forward to hearing your talks. Thank you uh, very much, Alexi. The art of making people listen to what you want to say. Um, now we're going to come to our chair judge, uh, Zilka Ackerman. Um, we saw her at the, the heats, and we're going to see her again now to chair the Oxfordshire Regional Final. Um, Zilka is a cultural historian and the director of the History of Science Museum, the first woman ever in this role. She takes a particular interest in making complex topics accessible to audiences of all backgrounds. And she is going to tell us about what further expectations we should have of the contestants now that we are no longer at the heats, but we have moved up a level to the regional final. Well, hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Um, and of course, we are now in the next stage of the competition. So content, clarity, charisma, we had excellent introductions, what all of that is, but all of you are here because you showed that in the heats. And what Rowena hasn't said so far is the cruel and terrible fact that only one of you will be put forward by the judges tonight. There will also be an audience winner but that means the number of contestants is going to be reduced radically. So content, clarity, charisma, but really almost in a God-bestowed way. It's got to be the moment where you completely grow beyond anything you've ever done before. You've got to rivet us in a way that we think, wow, can I have more of that, please? In a way that we really, really want to want to know what else is happening, that we completely forget what's happening to tonight elsewhere in the world or in our life or even in the rest of the competition. It's got to be very special. Now, you've all been to some training between last time and this time, so we expect some improvements and we will judge upon this. I'm looking forward to hearing this eight talks. Thank you very much, Silka. Uh, so just, just to clarify, uh, we're not having a vote for the audience winner, but we would like you to tell us on Twitter who you, you um, would put through as the winner. Um, and you can do that live and you can uh, do that after the event if you are watching this back later. Before you find out who the judges have put through, please tell us who you would put through after you have seen the act. It would boost everybody's morale, um, I'm sure, and it's quite exciting to see where your votes would go. So please share those with us at HSM Oxford, at FameLab, hashtag FameLab, and at Rowena FW. Let's face it, if you tweet me, I will just tweet back to all the others as well. So everybody will get to see that. Um, thank you, judges. So um, as uh, Silk has said tonight, we have got eight competitors. There are uh, seven heat winners and an audience winner who have come through to tonight. There will be one winner who goes through to the national final at Cheltenham Science Festival in June 2021. Just a single winner put through by the judges. So they will be, we'll be whistling the eight down to one. Uh, judges are going to deliberate during an interval before making their announcement. Uh, in the interval, I will be taking you on a journey into the history of Science Museum, and I will be tantalizing your brain with some magic tricks to untangle, all based, of course, on science. But it's time for our first contestant. So without further ado, um, let me introduce him, um, and then we will get started. 
So, Paul Dubois. Uh, Paul is a master student at Oxford studying mathematics and promises to be very interesting. And he's going to talk to us this evening about paper topology or paper topology kind of. So could we have Paul up please? Um, and then Paul, whenever you are ready to begin. Hello, so um, I'm Paul Dubois and uh, as Rowena said, I'm a master student in Oxford studying doing mathematics and tonight I will talk about mathematics. So please don't run away, don't be scared. Mathematics are much easier than uh, everyone thinks. Uh, mathematic, mathematicians just pretend to that it's um, that it's hard, but it really is much easier than um, one what one could think. Um, so what I would like to talk about tonight is um, a sub area of mathematics called topology. Topology is the study of shapes. Okay, so that may seem quite uh, abstract because shapes can in mathematics we consider that shapes can have any dimension, and then one dimension now uh, when we have more than three dimensions it's very hard to picture. So that's why tonight I will focus on surfaces in three dimensions. So surfaces are two-dimensional shapes and, three and the, the space that we consider would be three dimensions. So basically our world, okay. Um, so the first thing, the first shape that I would like to introduce to you tonight is um, the ones that we construct like this. So we take a piece of paper like this, a strip, and to make it a little bit more interesting, what I will do is link the two sides like this. So I will take a little bit of tape and I will glue the two sides as such, okay? So now, one thing that we could ask is how many uh, faces do we have? So it's, um, we, we would like to, um, to count them in a very methodological mef way. So what I will do is color, is paint each face with a different color. So I will paint the first one with, yeah, in red, okay? So now we have the exterior face that's red. And what I will do is now to color the other face, if I can find one, in black. Okay, so now we have the interior face, which is black, and the exterior face, which is red. So that's two faces, there are no others. So this shape has two faces, okay. Now what I will do is take another strip, but this time, instead of gluing it like this, I will twist it, okay? Twist it and then glue. And now I will try to count the faces, okay? Again, I'm gonna color each face that I can find with a different color. So let me start by doing this. I'll continue. Continue, continue on the other side. And here we go. And now you can see that I have everything that's colored in red. And trust me, you can try this at home. I did not change face. So this means that this shape, which is called in fact a Mobius strip, has only one face, although it's a two dimensional surface. So this can be quite counterintuitive. And in fact, this is why mathematicians love mathematics because we have facts that are very counterintuitive. Something even more counterintuitive could happen if you try to cut this shape. So if you had a pair of scissors and try to cut it, you will see something that's very different from if you cut this. And I would like to try this at home as a homework. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Could we have the judges up, please? Um, and, and Paul as well. Um, so uh, judges, uh, do you have questions for Paul? Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Alexi has got a question. Yeah, I have a question. So thank you so much. It's very interesting. Why should I care? So, so I, I really like your demonstration. Can you explain to me why, why does this matter? Why is it important? Um, so, I would say that in mathematics, there are many things that are um, first something that we no one really cares about and something that turned out to be very useful. So for example, a few years ago, um, people would study prime numbers with um, just interest in prime numbers. 
and it turns out that um, encryption in uh, for banks uh, for banks accounts are, are now using a lot of uh, prime number theory. Um, so it turns out that something that you may study in the beginning just for fun turns out to have some application that no one suspect um, years before. So this could be a first reason. And the second reason is that I would say it's fun. That's great, thanks so much. Okay, Sunitra? Well, um, following on from that, I guess you've sort of answered it in a way. Do you think we should only study things because they might be useful? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, of course uh, um, it's, it's very good to study things that are useful because um, I mean, that's how the society um, is getting better, but um, it's also, um, um, it's, I think I would say that it makes us um, different from any other species to have to study things that are not useful, that are just construction of our mind. And um, I would say that it's, uh, it's uh, a human achievement to, to find uh, this, uh, to study this concept of uh, abstract mathematics or philosophy. And we've got just time for a very quick question from William. Quick question, difficult answer. Can you explain why one twist does that and other types of twist wouldn't? Of course. Um, so if you take one strip, so you have two faces. Now, if I link the two, what, um, like this, I have, I'm linking basically the same face on this side to the other side. If I do a twist, well, then I'm linking the face that was um, down to the one that was up in here. And this is why you get only one face because you link the top face to the down face. Okay, thank you. That's it from us judges. Thank you very much, judges, and thank you very much, Paul. Well done. Uh, we will now be moving on to our second contestant for this evening. Um, that is Gulna Abdelieva. Uh, she is a DPhil in Oncology at the University of Oxford. She's from Azerbaijan and loves learning new things and playing volleyball, bowling and reading novels. When angry, she's always laughing. And she's going to talk to us about how music affects the human brain and ask the question, can music help heal disease and mental problems? So, whenever you're ready, Thank you, I'm ready. Hello, everyone. I want to start my talk with a story about my sister. She's 27 years old and she's a psychologist. She has always amazed me by having high scores in her study. But she's not a hard worker and she doesn't study a lot either. Interestingly, when she studies, she always listens to music. She reached her dreams quite quickly among her peers. It was interesting for me, maybe music acted as a powerful tool and helped her a lot. Actually, many studies have proved that music provides a total brain workout and uh, it helps us um, to manage pain, sleep better and be more productive. If this song makes you happy, well, it's because it affects your brain chemistry. Dopamine, which is the happiness hormone, it releases uh, during the moments of enjoyment while listening to music. It is what gives us the chills. But don't worry about what type of music you like. Research shows that your favorite music likely triggers a similar type of activity in your brain as other people's favorites do in theirs. Not only music helps us learn faster, but did you know that music acts as medicine and prevents several diseases? Have you ever heard about music therapy? Music has real uh, health benefits. It boosts the happiness hormone dopamine and it lowers the stress hormone cortisol and makes us great. Our brain is better on music. Music therapy use live or recorded music to help and prevent destruction from symptoms and side effects. In Alzheimer's patients, when they listen to Mozart's sonata, they function normally. And even it music reduces the severity of epileptic seizures. At molecular levels, study reveals that 
patients started to express higher levels of gene, which are involved stimulating and connection between brain cells. Music increased our response to rhythm. By doing this, music temporarily stops the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Rhythmic music, for example, has been used to help Parkinson's patient function, such as getting up and down and walking, because Parkinson's patients need assistance in moving, and music can help them kind of like a cane. There have been some studies showed that music therapy can help people with cancer patients. They get more relaxes and their immune system boosts. Their respiratory rates much lower than those patients who didn't have music therapy. I would like to conclude my talk by saying the slogan of Albert Einstein. I see my life in terms of music. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hilna. Seeing your life in terms of music must be uh, quite quite an interesting journey. Um, I'm reminded of um, Peter and, and the Wolf with all the different types um, of music for things like the duck. Um, that would be an interesting story um, in sound. Okay, could we have the judges up? Uh, it's time for you to ask Vilna some questions about her talk. Thank you very much, Gilna. And William is dying to ask a question. Yeah. As a, as a musician, I, I'm, rather, I'm rather fond of this. Stage. As you know, Einstein was quite a famous uh, violinist himself. I mean, he was a hobbyist, but he played a lot. Does it matter playing or listening? Does it make a difference? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I feel uh, I, I have read some uh, papers which showed that if you play music, it, uh, the musician's brain they have uh, more like capacity, which can get right hand side and left hand side of your brain get more interacted as compared to people listening to music. So musicians have some benefits as compared to people who listen to music. Of course, they have both um, benefits, but musicians have better than uh, other people. That's, That's why point. it's better to learn their specific uh, genes, which is active in musicians. Alexi? Yeah, so leading on from that, what's the difference between music and noise? Why don't do it? I assume I don't get the same benefits from listening to the dishwasher. What, what's 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 the, the scientific difference? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, in my view, the, when uh, mus if you compare music and noise, uh, music uh, is something that make you feel happy and when you listen music some parts of brain become light up as when you listen noise there is nothing uh, if you don't get anything like the specific uh, there is a research showed that when they look the people who listen the music their mri images showed uh, the specific parts of brain light up as compared when the people listen just noise which doesn't make uh, dif which makes a big difference as compared music and noise. So that's uh, the main difference between music and noise. And may I follow up from that yet again? Uh, what is music for some people is definitely noise for me. So um, how does, why does my brain react differently to that stimulation than other people's brains? I think uh, as I mentioned, music is like ordered sound but noise is disordered sound. So um, if like if we listen music, some people which uh, makes them happy or makes them some sad, it's kind of both mixtures of sound different waves in different frequencies. So I think uh, that's why uh, it's different than noise. When we um, listen to music, it's important that we feel music and that's why our brain parts become active. Some parts of brain react to this, no this music, this song, so which makes us happy or sad. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we need to leave it there. We'd love to continue this discussion, but thank we've you got very much. Robina looking with very hard stare at us. <laughs> Or maybe I just wanted to comment on music and um, and maybe point out that it is it, you still have hope. I'm I'm sure that I would I would like to believe that I can still 
um, learn things and I am about as musical as a piece of toast. So um, <laughs> I like listening, but I, I can't I can't play anything. I was terrible at recorder as a child, really, really terrible. Uh, but yes, thank you very much, Gilna, um, for you. that interesting insight. Um, it's really amazing how the human brain makes its connections. Um, and now we will move on to our third contestant. This is Katie Taylor. Um, Katie is a graduate engineer with a background in physics. Um, so she enjoys applying experimental physics um, to both her career in engineering, but also cooking with varying degrees of success. Um, she's gonna tell us about fusion energy, how to make a star on earth, also known as the most extreme, extreme cooking class you'll ever take. And indeed, she looks very much the part for it. Uh, whenever you're ready, Katie. Thank you. We can't see it at the moment, but right now the sun is burning away at the center of our solar system. And it's been on fire nonstop for the last four and a half billion years. It's thanks to the energy from the sun that we have life on Earth. It means that you and I can be here tonight and that you can be listening to this wonderful talk. The sun can provide all this energy because it uses the most energy efficient reaction known to physics, nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is kind of what it says on the tin. Nuclear is anything involving the nucleus, the center bit of an atom. And fusion is the bringing of things together to make something else. So nuclear fusion is the bringing together of nuclei to fuse and make a bigger nucleus. Simple, right? Well, no. Sadly, physics doesn't just allow small atoms to fuse willy-nilly, which is probably a good thing, to be honest. The nuclei of atoms are charged, positively charged, and like charges repel. I'm sure you've all stubbornly tried to force two like magnets together. It's really hard, but if you push hard enough, put enough work in, you can do it. And it's the same with fusing nuclei. You need to put in a lot of work, a lot of energy to start the reaction. But once it's running, you get more energy out than you put in. It's like starting a bonfire. You need some heat at the beginning, but then it becomes self-sustaining and you end up getting out more heat and light than you started with. So the sun uses this reaction to produce insane amounts of energy, but we can harness that same reaction here on Earth. And as futuristic as a world powered by stars may seem, we've actually been experimenting with this technology for the last 50 years. It's not been easy, but we have the capability to capture a star. And here's how. We start with our fuel, the nuclear we want to fuse. We use seawater and lithium, laptop batteries. And we heat these up to temperatures 10 times hotter than the sun. And when atoms get this hot, the electron that's chilling around the edge of the nucleus is stripped away, leaving that positively charged nucleus on its own. And we've now got a kind of soup of positive nuclei and electrons with a lot of energy. And this is called a plasma. Now, how on earth here do you contain and control all that superheated plasma? Well, I mentioned it was charged, and that means it responds to a magnetic field. So we can apply a magnetic field to this plasma and shape it and contain it. So we've heated up our fuel, we've turned it into plasma, and we've contained it in a magnetic field. And pretty soon those nuclear collisions are gonna start and we're gonna have fusion. And when our fuels fuse together, they produce an atom of helium in balloons and a neutron, a heavy particle with no charge. The helium is a bit rubbish, so we remove that, but the neutron is going super fast. We can convert this kinetic energy into heat. And this is where it all gets surprisingly Victorian, because if we can get that heat out thanks to the neutron, we can boil water and make steam, which can turn a turbine and do something useful, like generate electricity. So watch this space, because we're going to take the power of the sun that's given life on Earth up to now, and we're going to use it to power our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, the future energy as done in a cooking class. That's certainly a relatively novel way um, of approaching it. Um, but I, I have a feeling that at the moment you just have a mixture. Um, the chemistry of combining that is yet to happen and that, that heat gets going. OK, I can see our judges are coming up on screen. So I hope you're all ready to ask some questions. William. Sorry, Silke. I, I loved your comment about the Victorian output, the steam engine at the out, or the turbine at the output. It does seem very, very primitive to turn all that really high quality energy into old fashioned steam heat and then turn motors around to 
get it back into electricity. Are there any clever shortcuts to keeping the quality of the energy in the system all the way through? So this has kind of been looked at. Um, it's kind of, yeah, there's a lot of engineering challenges in regards to making power plants to get the energy from a star basically out. Um, and one of those obviously is how do you capture that energy? Um, and we've kind of found that the best way to do that is through the, when the neutron passes through materials, it heats it up quite a lot. And it kind of is the best way. There is, it's called direct energy conversion. And essentially you take the ions that come out of the plasma that I mentioned, and you can use those to generate electricity. But it turns out you need huge amounts of building space and um, you need to accelerate them along into spectrometer type sort of affairs. And it, it gets very, very complicated very quickly for a very small amount of electricity, which is unfortunate, but mm. yeah. Thank you, Sunitra. I actually had exactly the same question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why go to steam? Why not take it into something clever, like a little battery that you can... Uh, oh, well, clearly there's an interest okay. from the judges in that very question. Alexi, what was your question? This is not so different a question, but you make it sound so easy, right? I'm heading down to my kitchen now. So, so why, why aren't we doing this now? What are, the, what are the main challenges, apart from the energy capture at the end? You know, why, why aren't fusion reactors um, all over the place? Um, research reactors are, um, there's probably about a hundred worldwide going, sort of looking at doing all this, but at the moment up till now, it's kind of been a very experimental basis. It's been understanding these processes and understanding what's needed to put a giant plasma in a bottle, essentially. Um, I think in terms of the main challenges for making a power plant, we're going to be looking at material challenges. Um, we've kind of the neutron that's going out, while it's really useful, it's also really damaging. Um, and it can damage materials as they go through, which makes them structurally not okay. So you have to replace things quite regularly and then it becomes expensive and just, yeah, it, it creates a lot of issues. It's got pros and cons. It's good because it gives us energy, but it's bad because it causes damage. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's all right. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time for questions. Um, so thank you, Katie. It's okay. Thank you. I'm doing the Zoom equivalent of sneaking onto the stage and uh, raising my eyebrows at the judges there. Uh, but yes, thank you uh, very much um, for the cooking show um, with insane amounts of energy. Always very exciting. We're going to move on to our fourth contestant though. Uh, this is Elena Rodrigo Caro. Um, she is a postdoctoral reproductive and developmental scientist at Oxford University. Uh, she believes that everybody should try to reach their dreams regardless of the difficulty and she's going to talk to us about sperm great unknown companions, the seminal fluid extracellular vesicles. So uh, Elena, um, you are now up on screen whenever you're ready. Hello, lovely to be here again. Let me tell you something about last week. I was having some online drinks with my friends, having some laughs and my glass of wine, when we started talking about sex and pregnancy. It caught my attention that many of my friends believed that the man's role to get pregnant is just to provide the sperm. Well, that is not the whole story. Interestingly, the more unprotected sex you have with the father of your future child and with unprotected, I mean, without barrier contraception, the less likely is that a woman suffers pregnancy complications. Plus, in IVF, exposure to the male seminal fluid seems to increase the chances for an embryo to implant in the uterus. It's like the seminal fluid on its own can help to prepare the female to get pregnant like a warm up before a competition. The seminal fluid is a mix of secretions released with the sperm, and it contains huge amounts of extracellular vesicles that look like this. These vesicles are, in my opinion, the greatest unknown companions of the sperm. But what exactly are they? Well, they are really like letters used for cell communication in short and long distances. The sample cell produces the physical and introduces any information they want to convey 
or even any tools the recipient cell might need. Then, this vesicle will travel specifically to the target cell thanks to the delivery address. The seminal fluid vesicles deliver information from the male to the sperm to maintain their fitness, but more impressively, they deliver information to the female reproductive tract that's like sending a letter between continents. In the female, these vesicles could potentially protect against HIV. Regarding pregnancy, during my PhD, I showed that these vesicles bind to the cell in the lining of the uterus. This line then undergoes a series of changes after ovulation. So if five days later, an embryo arrives, it can implant and integrate to continue developing. I showed that these physicals can assist with these changes, and in this way, they can potentially increase the chances for a successful pregnancy. In short, these seminal fluid extracellular physicals are really like the fast wingman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. I almost wasn't ready for that. Everybody else has run over. So I had my horn um, <laughs> at the ready. And then you finished. I went, oh, all right. We've got our judges up on, on screen now. So um, I'm sure that they are going to ask you some sticky questions. Oh my God. Anitra, do you want to go first this time? All right. Um, right. So, so what sort of information do you think is being delivered to prepare the lining of the womb or whatever it is to to receive the egg that is a very good question uh, let me explain a little what's happened there basically the lining is like a wall and you want to construct another wall inside it and for that you basically need to change the, uh, take out the painting and rearrange any kind of leakage or a uh, support that has in there so it can go through so what I saw during my PhD is that the main bricks of this lining of the uterus that are normally changing from a straight to circular have higher capacity to reach that circular uh, structure in the right time. Because this is the funny thing about the implanting of the embryo. It has to happen between six and 10 days after ovulation. If it's too early or it is too late, that can lead to miscarriage or to other diseases. And we saw that these vesicles are actually uh, helping them to produce the proteins and hormones that uh, have this at the right timing. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Makes sense. <laughs> William? Is there any uh, individual compatibility issue? So you said that uh, uh, repeated unprotective sex can reduce the uh, probability of pregnancy complications, but does it matter who the donor of the sperm versus the seminal vesicles is? Well, that is actually a really good question. Um, there is not enough research on that yet, but I suspect it does. Because what I, I did observe when I was doing my studies is that certain males seems to have a different population of vesicles. So it might be possible that um, in males that are subfertiles, there could be a reduced population of the ones in charge of improving this. It's, it's still not great, no, but I mean, it's not secret that sometimes you have a woman that can never get pregnant and suddenly they change partner and hey, there it goes. <laughs> Okay, so what does that mean for me or for the audience sitting out there thinking, okay, um, uh, what, what, what does, how does this change my life? Well, I think for fast and one of the main um, message I wanted to transmit is that this cliche of the male being just the sperm is not really true. Then it's also, it will affect uh, people who want to plan for a pregnancy. Uh, because they can actually adapt and give them a bit more of preparation before they take out any contraception to get ready in the body. And this goes with the seminar uh, fluid vesicle as it goes when they start planning for taking uh, complements. And this actually make, could make a huge difference for superior patients 
because one in seven well, one in seven couples are subfertilized in the UK. And in 35% of the cases, we don't really know why. It's a problem with this implantation. If we can elucidate how exactly these physicals are increasing, it could be a very low cost therapy for this. Okay, really intriguing. Unfortunately, we need to leave it there. Um, so thank you very much, Elena. Thanks. I, thank you very much. Um, you could almost be a, a sinister interpretation of that in that the, the male body is uh, finding a way to subtly influence the female body without her knowing about it. Now that's another thought on that. I know that was not the purpose of Elena's talk and that was not what she was trying to convey, but you know, we could have a darker story. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our fifth contestant now, and this is Chloe Rubicombe. Uh, Chloe is a PhD student at the University um, of Sussex studying early universe cosmology. She likes to crochet and sew clothes in her spare time. And I almost read that as space time because uh, Chloe is going to tell us um, what happens as two stellar remnants orbit each other in a far flung region of our galaxy and ask can we use lasers to decipher the fingerprint they leave in the fabric of space-time? Chloe, whenever you are ready. I'd like to tell you about a most perturbing case, the hunt for gravitational waves. But first, let me introduce you to our suspect. Back in 1915, Albert Einstein reimagined gravity. He proposed that the fabric of the universe is made up of a sheet called space-time and massive objects curve this space-time. Now, if you have two massive objects, say two black holes, which are the dense remnants of massive stars and they orbit each other, as they orbit, they cause ripples in the fabric of space-time known as gravitational waves. And as these waves travel out, they stretch and squeeze the space-time they pass through. But by the time they reach us, they may have traveled millions of light years. And this would mean that they would only cause a change in distance of a fraction of the width of a proton, which is just tiny. And scientists have struggled for years and years to figure out how we could detect these gravitational waves. But the folks at LIGO came up with a dastardly plan to catch these gravitational waves in the act. And the first clue comes from the name LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And the key word here is interferometer. This is a device that measures interference. And interference occurs when two waves meet. And if, when they meet, their peaks occur at the same point, they will add together constructively to create a bigger signal. But if a peak meets a trough, they will cancel each other out and we will have deconstructive interference. Now, LIGO use, makes use of this, this, but with light in their interferometer. And it looks a bit like this. So we send in a laser and then we split it down two paths, each of length four kilometers. And when it reaches the end, they are reflected and they recombine at this point and are sent to the detector. Now, if the arm lengths are equal, uh, the detector will have constructive interference and there'll be a bright signal. But if the length of an arm changes due to a passing gravitational wave, say, this will lead to a change at the detector. And in 2015, scientists saw the first ever signature from two black holes spiraling in and merging. And this opened up a new horizon on our universe. Before we could see, but now we can hear. And who knows what's going bump in the night. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chloe. I was, I was read, more ready that time to, to not have to uh, do the horn it is a shame i do enjoy blowing it right <laughs> um hopefully not uh going to um blow anything out of the way now we have got the judges and they are ready to ask some questions thank you very much chloe so nitra wants to know what is going bump in the night 
Well, more how you started talking about Einstein reimagining something. So this is essentially a, a metaphor. Do you think, and, and it's a fantastic metaphor, it's obviously worked in all kinds of ways. Do you think we could have understood all of this in terms of a different kind of metaphor altogether? I, I think it's, yeah, it's highly possible. I think we've kind of, Einstein came up with such a great one. We've maybe all been a bit lazy and not thinking of a new one, but um, there are still problems like in matching up uh, gravitation, gravitational like physics and uh, like particle physics that they can't like mesh together with Einstein's theory. So we, we are having to, or physicists are working really hard on trying to, you know, bring that creativity to think of a new metaphor. Thank you, Chloe. Alexi, as a physician, wants to come in there. So, um, no, thanks so much for a really good, uh, a great exposition of this particular topic. But why, so you talk about Einstein and the fact that he uh, he sort of reinvented our understanding of time. That was a while ago. We've sort of gotten to grips with a lot of this physics, but we're still chasing the gravitational waves, right? Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think, you know, why is it still important? So, and, and what do, once we've got them, and we're really confident that we understand, you know, exactly what they have for breakfast. What, how much further on are we going to be? Why is it? Why are we investing all of this effort in this particular uh, quest? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there are some things like black holes that there are no other ways that, like, it's one of the best ways that we can learn things about them. Uh, like light, it's very difficult to learn anything with black holes because they're black and they then you can't really see them. Um, but also there's things like in the early universe that there's like a certain time frame where like before it, no light was emitted, but gravitational waves that were emitted before this could have traveled out. So we could use gravitational waves to see further back in time than we could with light. So kind of explore, yeah, really push the boundaries of our understanding. Oh, that's great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Oh, a very quick question from William. How much would that block had to have moved in order to be a get to get the uh, detectable uh, destructive interference? So it's something like um, one over ten thousand of the f of the width of a proton, which I don't have the number in my head in meters, oh. but it's it's kind of why it took like a hundred years to measure it because we had to get the experiments that were sensitive enough. That's super. Thank you, Chloe. Back to you, Rowena. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, struggling there just to uh, add the spotlight because everything was moving on my screen, but I am back. Um, interesting thought. Watch this space. Chloe, Chloe could be taking us into future time travel, and apparently the key is being really, really sensitive. So I like that. Uh, that is a, a, a good, a good storyline. Uh, we are on to our sixth contestant now this evening, um, and this is Maj um, Abdulghani. Uh, Maj is a DPhil student at Oxford University studying genetics. She hosts an Arabic science podcast, not at all niche, um, and has a thing for fantasy books, which is quite broad. Um, she actually entered university age 15 due to a loophole in the system, but that's not what she's going to be talking about. Um, she's going to be uh, t uh, telling us uh, how our obsession with cleanliness is making our immune system so crazy it attacks harmless food. Okay, Madge, so uh, whenever you are ready. Thanks, Rowena. You may have noticed that the number of people with food allergies has been rising as you grow older. It's not just your imagination. The percentage of children with food allergies in the US has more than tripled in just 10 years. And it's been rising in many other countries, mainly developed ones. Scientists are blaming hygiene. According to the hygiene hypothesis, food allergies are becoming more common because we're just living too cleanly and this is having a negative impact on our immune system. A food allergy is basically when a person's immune system freaks out over something in their food and thinks it's an evil microbe when it's really a harmless protein. A strong and healthy immune system is better able to tell the difference between friend and foe. 
mainly because it's been exposed to many friends and foes. But when it hasn't been trained to fight real enemies because it's been sheltered from them for a long time, it's easy for it to mistake harmless proteins for harmful microbes. In fact, children who live in farms or who go to daycare and so are exposed to all kinds of microbes are not as likely to develop food allergies as other children. And the effect of too much cleanliness stretches back to our earliest days. Babies born with a C-section, a medical procedure done under aseptic conditions, are more likely to develop food allergies compared to babies born naturally. During natural birth, the baby passes through the vagina and gets exposed to so many microbes from the mother's, from the mother's vagina. And so the immune system is being trained from the get-go to recognize friends and foes. Food allergies are so linked to too much cleanliness that one form of treatment for them that's under development involves the dirtiest thing you can think of. Poop. Yep, scientists are looking into poop transplants as a quick and dirty way to boost the immune system of people with food allergies. The idea is healthy people have a wide variety of healthy bacteria in their guts that help their immune system distinguish between harmful, pro, harmful microbes and harmless bits of food. People with food allergies just don't have the same microbial diversity. So you take, and since poop comes out of the gut, it also carries a lot of the bacteria that's in it. So you take the poop of a healthy person and use it to repopulate the gut bacteria of a person with a food allergy. It's already worked in babies with allergic colitis. But please don't try it at home. Apart from the mess, it's still under clinical trials. The point is, exposure to microbes from early in life trains our immune system rigorously to keep us healthy and allergy free. I'm not saying we should stop bathing or sterilizing medical equipment, but we don't have to obsess over everything around us being so clean. Let's embrace a bit of rolling around in the mud. Thank you uh, very much. I'm sure I, I wasn't supposed to be laughing quite as much, but it was a good job that I had my sound off. Um, all right. Um, so we have our, our judges coming up on the screen. Perhaps you could deliver some new questions about this topic. Thank you very much, much. And I will take the prerogative of the chair and jump in there straight away. Now we are currently in a, in a time uh, where of course, Everybody is obsessed with sterilizing everything. Yep. And you're coming in there and saying, come on, <laughs> let's roll in the mud. Let's touch hands. Let's be really quiet. Well, Can you respond I, to a person like that? Disclaimer, don't do this in a pandemic. <laughs> in a pandemic, maybe do make sure you wash your hands and sterilize them as often as possible. Okay, so... <laughs> food transplant until we've got through the pandemic. Although it's interesting, I would be really interested to see if the number of like food allergies increases a, a while mm -hmm. after COVID, you know, just because we are being too clean. And this is being shown to be linked to all kinds of allergies, not just food allergies. That would be a very interesting question indeed. So Nitra, you had your hand up. So it's sort of um, recasting your question in a more general way. So forget the pandemic. I mean, we live with lots of other infections all the time. You talked about protection against allergies. What about protection against other infections? Um, I, yeah, it all, it, I mean, the population of uh, microbes in our guts really helps boost the immune system in general. So that can help protect from other infections as, but I'm focused specifically on food allergies, but there are studies that show it helps with other diseases and infections as well. Thank you, William. Somebody had to do it first, didn't they? Is there a lesson here for how uh, cesarean sections should be handled in the future? I am not a physician, so I, I will refrain from giving any judgment on, on how cesarean sections should be made. Like I said, medical equipment should be sterilized for sure. Um, so I will leave it at that. Thank you. I saw Alexi raising her hand. Yeah, just a, just a quick question. Very so, brief question. 
Yeah, yeah. So just to sort of expand, we've talked about, uh, you know, the sort of the broad scope of this, but the um, is it just the gut that's in play here? Because you hear about, I, I say I'm not in anything close to a medic, so I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but maybe you can enlighten me. But things like peanut allergies, my understanding is that that is not really a gastric response. Is there a link to those sorts of allergies as well? So actually, um, the gut bacteria is important, but there are also other hypotheses for why food allergies could be increasing. And one of them is that it could be, for example, a few years ago, it was um, some of the guidelines said that you shouldn't expose your babies to peanuts, for example, or to eggs, because uh, you know that could cause the food allergy. But actually, it turns out it's early exposure to these allergens that helps the immune system mm. know that, oh, this is, this is food because otherwise it can be exposed from other routes. For example, if there's like, if there's a, a wound and there's peanuts lying around, then you know the peanuts, the peanut bits are getting into the body through the wound. And so the immune system doesn't recognize it as food because it didn't see it through the gut. So there are other ways that food allergies can develop. It doesn't have to be our gut bacteria, but it also plays a big role. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can, can, can I uh, encourage us to, to finish there? Yeah, all right. That's you, you. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you uh, very, very much, Vaj. I, I, I feel like you have uh, validated my entire parenting technique, which is, yeah, sure, you can play in that and uh, eat it. Yeah, that, that's probably fine. Um, so um, I already know my daughter is not allergic to, to peanuts because the amount of peanut butter that has gone down that child is insane um but yes thank you very much for your talk that was really interesting um and we will be moving on now to our pen ultimate uh, our last but one almost at the end contestant this is tom gregory tom is a phd student at imperial college london looking at how we can use mathematics to better understand and forecast weather and climate his research focuses on computer algorithms for global ocean models and interestingly he has a scar older than himself um, and he's going to tell us about the matrix this is a piece of mathematics used everywhere that none of us ever seems to see yet underpins everything we do and apparently he says that all modern science depends on it and it's starting to take over the rest of our lives too so, Tom, whenever you're ready. There's a piece of mathematics that's ubiquitous. It's used everywhere, no matter what calculation we do on a computer or what kind of piece of fundamental science we rely upon. And yet, nobody ever seems to talk about it. It's hidden in plain sight. And so today, I want to champion one of the most productive pieces of mathematics. You probably remember it as the simultaneous equation. You probably think of simultaneous equations as the bit where algebra and maths at GCSE got boring. But we're going to re remind ourselves how they work and kind of explore some of the applications we have for them today. So simultaneous equations, what are they? It's a classic question. Sarah goes to the supermarket and buys three apples and five bananas and she spends 55p. Dave goes to the supermarket and buys four apples and two bananas and spends 50p. So far, so straightforward. An apple's 10p, a banana's 5p. I'm sure you remember many boring practice questions in your secondary school maths lessons working that out. But actually, using this knowledge is really important. It underpins all the simulations, all of the data analysis we do in modern science. The hard bit is if we add more fruits. Two fruits, fine. But if I start including strawberries, coconuts, papayas, oranges, the problem gets bigger. And if I double the problem, using straightforward algorithms takes eight times as long. Now, a weather forecast has 10 million of these variables. So you can see why mathematicians still have a job. Mathematicians would call this matrix theory. And what we do is we bundle up all of those little ratios in the simultaneous equations, put them into an object, multiply it by our variables, and we have an outcome. And this hard calculation needs solving on a computer. In many ways, it's the one trick we actually have for solving calculations. It's used when we want to simulate things, like the weather, like fluids, anything to do with that. It's when used when we want to analyze data, so machine learning, or any kind of statistical analysis of science or experimental outcomes. But particularly, because it's being used in these statistical analyses, it's being used by the likes of Google and Facebook to work out things about you 
and they know lots of things about you, set up a load of these equations and solve them to know what they can sell you right now or what they think you're in the mood to buy. Netflix offered a million dollars to the person who could optimize their systems, their matrix solving systems to better improve their recommendations. That's how much these matrices underpin. They underpin everything and yet we don't talk about them. They are the workhorse of modern mathematics. And in fact, the more general version of it, the revolution of matrix theory is linear algebra, which underpins both of our understanding pieces of modern reality, quantum mechanics and general relativity. I'm not telling you whether these things are good or bad. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought that the matrix was going to be something sinister and then, oh wait, hang on, Google is gathering information about us. I, I think it's still a pretty sinister thing, although um, I like your analogy that, uh, that Netflix um, uh, is so important and underpins everything. Um, I'm sure the judges will have something to ask about that. So nothing but the truth there, Tom. Why does it matter for, for me, for every everybody out there? Because every decision being made that involves some kind of data or some kind of simulation is being passed through one of these calculations on a computer. We we build supercomputers to crunch these things. The government invested a billion pounds last year in a new supercomputer for the Met Office to develop these things, right? So solving these equations underpins probably literally every major computational task that's carried out. Anytime we do a statistical analysis, which every scientist is going to, almost every scientist, every science I can think of, carries out either a simulation or some statistical analysis at some point. And if you're doing this with lots of data or a big enough simulation, you're going to need a matrix solver at some point. So making sure we have efficient versions of those, which is not a glamorous task, let me tell you, as someone who works in that, it's not something we talk about often. It's not something we, uh, we think about often. But I think because it's in every decision we make, right? every piece of data analysis that big tech companies do on us, uh, you know, our guidance systems and our GPS devices, you know, all of these things, big calculations rely on matrix results and matrix solvers so i think it's time again they get the praise that they deserve okay thank you alexi thanks so much so so how are these algorithms going to get better um in in, in particular you know is it is it about more data or is it about better data i like the netflix analogy is great because i have no idea how netflix gets the ideas that it, it proposes to me but they're they're <laughs> they're a disturbingly uh, sort of uh, perpendicular to the kinds of things that I might actually be interested in. What's going wrong there, and and what you know what what needs to be tweaked to to, to do better? Uh, well, I will say this is a fairly mature field. We do we do relatively well in it, but even still, half the time in a weather forecast and a weather forecast, like I say, massive supercomputer being run for many hours to get a weather forecast, half the time is still these linear solvers. So there's work to do. What needs to be done better is often quite problem specific, which is half of the half of the problem, right? In that our methods are trying to make these systems better. So what I'd call preconditioning as a, as a solvers guy, we, we need to precondition the system to make it look nicer before we try and solve it because solving's hard. So we want to make a nice system that we can solve nicely. It often depends on the problem. So if it's physically motivated and it comes from say a fluid scenario, it might be appropriate to use something called multigrid where we try and make the system look simpler and simpler solve it on the simplest system and then bring it back down to the finest, most complex system again. For data-based methods, it might be better to try and collapse the data. So actually more data makes the problem even bigger still. It's also important to make use of the changing architecture of computers. Computers now aren't po more powerful than they used to be. This is a kind of common misbelief. They tend to be more parallel. So instead of having more powerful cores, more powerful brains, we have more of them. And so coming up with techniques that make use of all of these cores is really hard, actually. And so we have to think about how we change our methods to do that. As machine learning takes over, that also changes computer architecture. A lot of weather scientists aren't happy because their favorite type of architecture they've been developing for for decades is changing into this machine learning based one that has different priorities when it comes to preconditioning and matrix solving. So there's a real set of antagonistic things working against each other, but the making them better is normally problem specific. It depends on your application and the, the fine mathematical structures, which I find beautiful myself as a mathematician, uh, exploiting those as best we can. 
Well, it's clearly an awful lot to discuss there. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there um, because we're running out of time for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. I'm impressed that you have managed to find some mathematical beauty in what sounded like a lot of messy data going on there. But thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, judges. And we are and to the final contestant, the last performer, the final person to cheer on. I hope you're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we've had a great evening and some very good talks so far, and we're going to have one more of them. Uh, this is uh, Sean Elias. Um, he is a public engagement with research immunology postdoc working on the COVID-19 vaccine at the Genet Institute. Uh, his interest in teaching science using board games and was best man to the scientist who developed the original Chadox one viral vector for the vaccine. Um, and Sean is going to tell us about Alice in Corona Land, how the Red Queen helps us to understand viral variants. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, Rowena. So viruses mutate at a very high rate. And the consequence of this is actually more notable in a, the situation such as a pandemic, where there are much higher numbers of viruses. Some mutations have no effect on the virus. Others result in changes to the virus, in particular its proteins or structure. Now, some of these are better or worse. Natural selection generally leads to advantageous mutations being passed on to the next generation. So what does this have to do with Alice? Well, viruses and their hosts are locked into what we like to call an evolutionary arms race. The Red Queen hypothesis is derived from a statement that the Red Queen makes to Alice in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. Now, here you see it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. Now, under this interpretation, species have to run or evolve to stay in the same place or else go extinct if the other side gains an unassailable advantage. This is a 3D model of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Now, the virus binds to cells via the ACE2 uh, receptor, and this allows for entry into cells. In turn, this spike protein is a target for our antibodies, which uh, can prevent the virus infecting the cells. Now, this is the battleground for which this current arms race is ongoing. Now, antibodies can bind to the region where spike protein uh, interacts with ACE2, or it can bind to other parts of the, in, of the uh, spike protein, preventing cellular entry. Antibodies also can flag this, uh, the coronavirus to our immune system using by binding to the spike protein. Now, to counter this, the virus can mutate as we mentioned earlier, and this can prevent the binding of antibodies. Now, you'd think the natural place to do this is that region at the top where it interacts with ACE. However, this can actually be quite costly to mutate for the virus. This could lead to slower, bi slower binding, uh, less efficient binding, and slower uptake into the cells, or abolish that interaction altogether. However, we do actually see mutations to this region. These actually don't tend to have an effect on antibody binding. So why are they evolving it? Well, it does allow quicker entry into the cells and more efficient binding. Interestingly, this is actually not to, to counteract our immune systems. It's to give the virus an advantage over other virus variants, allowing it to compete in a parallel arms race. Both strategies, immune evasion and this um, increased uptake, uh, I've seen in the current variants that are about in the populations, in the Kent, the South African and Brazilian variants. So should we be worried about these? Uh, there are three reasons not to be. Our immune system can attack the virus on multiple fronts. Uh, it can train itself when it sees the variants. And it can, we can develop new vaccines to train it in advance before we see them. It's no easy task to win an arms race, but it can be done. After all, we eradicated smallpox. Thank you. Thank you uh, very, very much, Sean. Uh, for that, for our last uh, uh, final fail bad talk and something very topical at the moment. I see the judges are sneaking up on screen. So um, I'm sure you are burning to ask some questions. Clearly, 
a very pertinent topic there, Sean, which um, everybody out there has been thinking about or has been affected by for quite a while. What does that mean now for the, for the research we're doing? How is this going to affect our next steps? So we obviously, from the point of view of vaccine development, we obviously need to keep track of what mutations are happening and what are the reasons for this? What are the evolutionary pressures that are driving these mutations? And we have to respond. Um, we need to stay in that kind of, at least in that middle ground so we're not losing, losing to the virus, but we also need to get ahead of the virus so we can hopefully end the pandemic uh, and move forward and to that. And we can develop vaccines very quickly. Vaccines are the most effective way to stay ahead of the curve and stay ahead in, in this arms race. But we have to acknowledge that there will be times where the virus count counters that. Um, and all we can do is, is keep with scientific progress. Thank you. William. I've got to be careful because this is obviously something I'm working on at the moment, Sean. So I'll, 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 but I'll ask you a question a lot of people uh, are asking. Um, it's been reported that the Kent variant, which has just got that one mutation that improves the, um, well, the important one, that improves the ACE2 binding, um, makes people sicker and is, has greater lethality. Do you want to speculate why that might be? Because it's not necessarily an interest of the virus, is it? No, it's very much not. So obviously, from an evolutionary point of view, killing your host is a bad thing for any virus, because the quicker you kill something, the less time you have to spread to another one. Um, in terms of the lethality, it's probably possibly down to expression of ACE2 in the different parts of our body, uh, particularly in the, as you go lower in the lungs, there's more ACE2 expression. And there's also a different ACE2 expression on different um, tissues and organs within our body. So it's most likely down to certain organs in certain parts of the body where the, the, the virus is entering and causing more problems. And it's probably specifically, yeah, down to that mutation in those organs. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Sunitra. Okay, well, of course, I also work on the stars. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, do you think we can eradicate SARS-CoV-2? We would all love to say that, but as a realistic uh, scientist, I would say it's at the moment highly unlikely. If you look through history, the only well, there's the only human virus that we, well, human, sorry, human pathogen we have eradicated is smallpox. We have eradicated rinderpest um, as, a, as another pathogen, but even something like polio, where we're massively on top of it, we haven't managed to get that last stage of eradication. We can control it massively, but it, uh, we're not quite there. And I think it's very highly likely that um, with COVID, it'll be the same. I think we can manage it. I think we can eventually get to a point where we can control it Quite significantly and in a lot of countries but i think there's probably likely to always be a, be a reservoir somewhere this is also overcomplicated by the fact that there's lots of similar viruses that are, we can still find in in various animal populations so we're likely to get something similar spillover probably at another time thank you very much sean we need to leave it there unfortunately so back to you Rubina. thank you very much john thank you very much judges um of course they didn't at all set you up with a difficult panel of judges there who know all about your topic. Um, but I guess that is just the luck of FameLab. You never know who's going to be judging you and you have to be able to talk both to the experts and to the complete layperson. Uh, our judges are going to disappear now. They will be going into a breakout room and they will be deliberating, they will be arguing, they will be discussing and they will be sharing their opinions about who we've just seen. And the aim of coming to a decision about who our one winner is going to be for the Oxfordshire Fame Lab regional final. And that person is going to go through to the UK final in Cheltenham Science Festival in June. But I would like you to go onto Twitter at HSM Oxford, at Fame Lab, hashtag Fame Lab, and at Rowena FW, and tell us who you liked what you liked about them, what you learned, just excite us with the science that you've been uh, listening to. And uh, in order for you to do that, let me remind you of the contestants that you have just seen. Uh, so you saw Paul, uh, um, who told us um, about how to make something that seemed two-sided, actually one-sided. Uh, we saw Gulner who told us about the magic cure that is music. Uh, we saw Katie, 
uh, who uh, released energy by forcing like charges together. Uh, we saw Elena, uh, who was using seminal fluid to deliver more than just sperm. Um, we saw Chloe, who was interfering with gravitational waves. And we saw Madge, um, who uh, told us about a quick and dirty boost to the immune system. Um, we saw Tom, who told us why Netflix is like the weather. And last of all, we saw Sean, who told us about the viral arms race. I hope you have something interesting to say about those. They were certainly very interesting, packed with information. The judges have got a very hard job. Once again, there will be one winner uh, from the judges who's going through to the Cheltenham Science Festival in June. And now we're going to have a brief interval and a little bit of magic from me. So we are all set up. I have got my, my demonstration table um, at the ready, and I am going to take you uh, into the history of Science Museum, tell you a few stories, tell you about some of the exhibits that you might see there, and do a few magic tricks, because why not? I have my curtain, I'm all set up for this, and uh, you need entertaining whilst we wait to hear from our judges. So. We're going into the basement, that basement lab at the History of Science Museum, where we would be surrounded by quadrants, uh, astrolabes, sundials, mechanical clocks, manuscripts, and early photographic kit. Now, uh, the early photographic kit is, is interesting because there's some stuff from one person uh, in particular known as Dodgson. Now, Dodgson was a clergyman and a mathematician at Christ Church, Oxford, but is better known as somebody who we have heard mentioned this evening, and that's Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll, the writer of Alice in Wonderland and uh, Alice through the Looking Grass, the creator of the White Rabbit, who was always looking at his watch, um, the dodo, um, and uh, running faster, just to say, on the same place. Uh, interestingly, uh, Lewis Carroll was a member of the Inklings, which is a writing group uh, at Oxford. In fact, I was once a member of a reincarnation of the Inklings, obviously not having the original members of it, but it was a, an all-star cast, all cast uh, filled with people like uh, Lewis Carroll, um, but also with J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, who was obviously known for The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And in fact, the very memorable quote which comes out of the Inklings comes uh, not uh, from Lewis Carroll, but from uh, Professor Hugo Dyson, who is a slightly lesser known uh, member. Um, and that apparently was the um, moment when, in reading Lord of the Rings, um, Tolkien brought up yet another new character, a new scene, um, and uh, 
Hugo Dyson jumps to his feet and exclaims, Not another elf! So apparently too many elves are possible and my understanding of Lord of the Rings having just slightly too much love for the elf race was apparently felt at the time when it was being written as well. I'm sure if I were part of that writing group, I would be the one exclaiming about too many elves. Now, uh, what the museum has actually, um, as I will share with you, um, I am not actually uh, forbidden from sharing slides, um, is a photograph by Dodgson. So Dodgson decided, um, or, or Lewis Carroll, that he was really interested in photography. He took this up later in life, uh, aged about 24, um, and continued it for most of his life uh, with uh, a little bit, um, uh, I think at some point uh, of loss of interest towards the end, but pretty much most of his life very interested in it. Um, and uh, he... Um, took this photograph, which is the one and only one in the History of Science Museum, uh, of two little girls uh, dressed as Queen Eleanor, uh, the wife of Henry II, and Fair Rosamond, his mistress. Um, and this is from an old um, Oxford fable about how uh, Eleanor offers her rival uh, the choice of a dagger or poison uh, in order to end her own life because the queen doesn't like her, her king having a mistress. And the story goes that Rosamond chose the poison. Um, this is a story, I think, of life hanging in a balance. Um, and this moment of the decision uh, and the quest is meant to be where the story centers. And the thing I find most interesting about that story is the fact that instead of it being a story about the decision that ends at the point of the decision as a cliffhanger, we do find out that she made a decision and which one she picked. I think I would be a bit reluctant to make that choice and would do everything I could to get out of the situation. But um, I guess that historically you're supposed to uh, uh, gracefully um, um, embrace your fate. Uh, but yeah, this is the story told by this photograph. So uh, it's a very posed photograph, um, as in the early days, uh, photography was considered a new form of art. So now it's much more considered a science. So that's just an interesting way in which our perspectives have changed. Um, talking of drinks, though, um, I have a, a little demonstration uh, for you here. Um, and as we talked about life of the balance, this is a balancing game I have got a can and uh, I will challenge you to find a way to make this can balance on its edge. Now as you can hear if I try to do this the can mysteriously mysteriously tips dingles and decides that it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I can try quite hard but it seems illogical surely if I hold it like this you can see that there is more mass above the top point than the bottom point. This is not going to tip itself over or indeed stay in one place. However, if I balance this very, very carefully, I might just be able to do it. And if I can't quite do it, there is a small adjustment that I can make which should allow me to create that balance and your challenge here is to identify what change I might have made to my can to make it stay upright. I think it's not going to behave too well. It's not going to stay up. Oh, hang on. There we go. What, what has happened to my can? What have I done to it in order to make it mysteriously not tip over? Uh, under its own weight. I have done something to it. I have changed it. In fact, actually, I have got two identical cans, uh, one that will not balance and one that will balance. But do you know what it is? What is the trick that allows this to happen? Tweet us at HSM Oxford if you think you know what this one is, and I will be revealing a bit more about it later on. Uh, but now, um, as we have talked a bit um, about poisons and potions, um, let me tell you another story. Now, this, this one is a bit about uh, chemistry, and in fact, it's about colour. 
Um, color is incredibly powerful. It communicates emotion, beauty, its status, unleashes creativity, and it's a major part of art. Uh, drawing our attention, getting us engaged. Color is powerful. And some of the most uh, engaging and powerful colors were considered to be uh, the blues. Um, our judges appear to be back. That's uh, very, very quick. Um, I'm going to carry on just for a little bit to keep people engaged and show them a few more magic tricks. But I can see that you are uh, keen um, and uh, rapid indeed. Um, maybe you had unanimous decision. But yes, colour, very interesting. The story, however, of the creation of the first dyes is very, very interesting. So in uh, this story, we have the character William Perkin, and he was actually a bit like one of our contestants, um, uh, a bit of a, an early starter. And at age 15, he became a member of the Royal Society. Um, and he was working for somebody called Wilhelm von Hoffmann, and Hoffmann wanted to try to make quinine in his lab because then he thought we could help cure malaria. We've heard also about how that's uh, still being studied today. Um, and he tried to do some experiments in his home lab, a bit like the HSM um, old style uh, lab in the basement, uh, to make that. Um, only wasn't too successful. Now, this was quite a dangerous venture. Only a year earlier, another student had burned himself distilling benzene and aniline um, uh, from naphtha, um, and his injuries actually led to a slow and excruciating death. So not something you would want to take lightly. Um, and um, uh, William, however, he was determined um, and he decided to experiment around. And he made something which turned out to be a disappointing black lump but he poured some water on it to try to wash it away um, or some solvent on it try to get it off his desk and instead he made a big purpley blue smear which turned out to be the first creation of the dye movine uh, and movine is particularly uh, interesting because it was one of the colors that people really really wanted to make um, and um, he uh, was just making it by complete accident. It was the first discovery of a color dye. It led to the discovery of more color dyes. And in fact, the idea that we could even make dyes in the beginning. Um, so have you all got your, your interval drinks? I hope you've got your interval drinks. So you might have something like a gin, maybe even a blue gin like this. And then maybe you might want to add some tonic to it. Lovely branded stuff was not um, paid for this. Um, and it's amazing how something like a little bit of tonic can change the color of our drinks. Now, obviously none of you believe that I just poured gin in the bottom of that, so I'm going to drink some of this. Just so that you believe that that's perfectly safe. Now again, magic trick. I had blue and I turned it to purple, but what did I do to it? Uh, how did the tonic water, which is honestly real tonic water, um, what uh, happened and what was the edible blue substance? Can you tell me what trick I have just played on you? And I've gotten a little drink if I need a refreshment. Again, tweet us at HSM Oxford. Uh, there were some other instruments um, that could be found in the History of Science Museum. Microscopes, telescopes, a small bottle containing the penicillin sample that we mentioned in the heats. Go back there if you want to hear the story. Uh, we have Dorothy Hodgkin's Perspex model and Einstein's blackboard, chemical glassware and early X-ray diffraction equipment. This piece that you can see if you go to the History Science Museum um, is uh, made by Henry Mosley and he made his own X-ray diffraction equipment. He uh, used this kind of equipment to discover that the nucleus um, of atoms contain unique numbers of proteins. Now, pro protons, not proteins. Uh, if you are a chemist, then you're like, yeah, that's obvious, but it wasn't obvious in the day. Originally, the periodic table was arranged by mass with a few deviations. 
Um, and um, one, of, one of our judges apparently might also be getting a gin and tonic, so apparently I'm quite inspirational. Um, um, and um, this, this amazing equipment um, was uh, able to guide us to a new understanding of the order of the elements to find out what was right inside them and I know in some of the talks today we've gone even deeper we've gone even smaller than the, pro the proton uh, but this was the first step towards that an amazing discovery um, and unfortunately uh, we don't have um, anywhere near as much as we could have about Henry Mosley uh, because he died he um, went into World War One he volunteered with the Royal Engineers um, and he died in Turkey and another thing that the museum do have from him is this entry in his mother's diary uh, telling of the terrible news of her son's death and it's thought that maybe if he had survived he could have won a Nobel Prize they're not given posthumously even just for the work that he'd already done so this was quite groundbreaking stuff um, does remind me I have to say of uh, my own uh, physics lessons uh, in school and I had a teacher who for some reason um, was perfectly aptly named Mr. Careless and he did uh, a demonstration for us that I'm going to do for you now see if you can work this one out it uh, involves a tin of golden syrup uh, which I have here and um, putting it on a slope what will happen to a tin of golden syrup on a slope it rolls, right? So a tin of golden syrup put on a slope will roll down the slope. Or will it? Again, it's a trick of two. I have got two tins of golden syrup. One of them rolls and one of them does not. They both contain golden syrup. What is different about them? Why does one roll down the slope and why does the other bob back and forth? What is going on here? So that's another little mystery uh, for you to get your teeth into. Once again, uh, Twitter. So what I'm going to do in a moment is I am going to tell you the answers to these magic tricks. But first, I'm just going to give you one more that I'm not going to tell you the answer to. I'm sure you can find out what the answer is. It's not the most mysterious of them at all, um, but it will be interesting for you to take one away uh, to think about. And this is a trick with an egg. Put an egg in water and it's going to sink, right? Or maybe it's going to float. Why does the egg float in the water? Actually, I think you've worked out my pattern now. I've got two cups of water. If I put the egg in this one, it does sink. But if I put the egg in this one, it floats. What is the difference between my two cups of water? In fact, what happens if I start combining them? If I mix a bit of one into the other, the egg sinks. And the egg sinks again. So one of them made it float, but when I combine, oh, and I can drink both of these. Just in case you wondered. Um, what was happening to make the egg float and why when I combine them did that stop happening? Okay, I'm going to tell you the answers to the tricks that I showed you, and then we are going to go straight over to the judges, um, and the judges are going to give us their results. So, uh, first of all, we had the two can can trick, and why can one of them balance on its side and the other not? And the answer is that this one is empty, and this one contains some water. If you put just enough water that when you tip it at this angle, it fills across here, the center of mass is moved down from the top to the bottom, and it allows the center of mass to be exactly down the middle, and it can balance, well, exactly down the middle, exactly down the middle of where the contact point is, um, and it can balance perfectly in that position. And uh, I also had the um, color changing gin and tonic, 
this is something that you've probably done um, in school. It's using a universal indicator, except that this indicator is not your standard universal indicator because that one is toxic. Do not drink that. This is something called butterfly PT. This is my packet that I use to prep up my table. And butterfly PT is perfectly drinkable. Um, and it will um, change color from blue to pink because tonic water is acidic and changes the color of my solution. Um, and thirdly, last of all, we have got my two tins of golden syrup. Why does one of them roll and the other one not? And the answer here is that golden syrup is a viscous liquid. If you have got a tin with a, a small amount of golden syrup in it, um, then that golden syrup will all sink to the bottom. You tip it and the golden syrup will very, very slowly start to even out. And because that takes a while, it takes a long time for the golden syrup to start sliding down. If your golden syrup tin is completely stuffed full, so there is no air gap, it will roll evenly. Uh, if you have got two golden syrup, syrup tins uh, and they're both partially filled but to the same height, if you warm one of them up to make it less viscous, that one will roll evenly. In this case, I couldn't guarantee having my golden syrup tin still warm in time. So I have one that's not entirely full and has an air gap and one that's entirely full. And to make sure that I knew the difference between them, this one has still got the seal on it. And this one has not. So if you were uh, um, very careful watching, you might have spotted that. Once again, I will not tell you the answer to the egg trick. You can have a guess at that. I'm sure some of you out there are already going, I know the answer to that one. But we have seen enough of me. We have heard um, enough of our stories. And it's time to go back to FameLab and hear from the judges. So judges, will you come up and tell us uh, about the contestants and your final decision. Well, thank you very much, Rowena. What an evening we've had. We've learned everything about sperm's wingman and about music in the brain and about the matrix that is everywhere. So what were we looking for tonight? We were looking for an interesting setup an exciting tenterhook that really kept us engaged, not knowing what's coming next and thinking, oh, I wonder where that is going. We were looking for new light on an old topic, accessibility, and the huge skill to make something exciting to those who know the topic and really interesting for those who didn't. And we got that. Our winner tonight is the person who combined all of that. And that is where Rovina is in the Hollywood version going to start the drums, aren't you, Rovina? I, I can, I can start the drums. I can even blow the horn. So out of eight fantastic contestants, we all agreed that one had everything. And that is Katie. So congratulations to Katie. Thank you. <laughs> oh my. Um, yay. Lost for words, I think that well done, Katie, um, for a, a stellar performance this evening. Um, and of course, well done, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, judges, uh, for your decision and, and your hard work tonight. And I hope you can go away and enjoy those gin and tonics. And, um, and Katie, you can, you can celebrate. Um, so yes, uh, well done. And if I may say, on behalf of the judges, it was a really difficult decision. When I said, well, give me your top person, the kind of pages came up. Uh, and that always really speaks for the quality of every contestant. So you've all done extremely well. And the topics were so complex. And you made them so accessible. 
Um, we all learned something new tonight. I, I was, of course, at the heats as well. And I remember the, the uh, presentations then. And I can honestly say, what a huge leap from then to now. And it's only been, what, a month? So where are you going next? I can't wait to see that. So thank you all very much from the judges. Okay. Thank you, thank you uh, everybody um, for this evening. Um, there isn't much more for me to do, but I, I will finish up um, just with uh, a few uh, reminders and uh, a thank you to everybody. So first of all, uh, evaluate it. Tell us what you think. The History of Science Museum have got an evaluation form and they would love you to fill it in. Um, and that can be found in the description box below the YouTube video um, of this. So go hunt it out, um, express your opinions. Also take to Twitter, tell us what you think about the magic tricks. Tell us the answer to the egg problem. I know you know it. Um, tell us about the contestants, uh, tell us new things that you learn, tell us what you might have talked about. Please uh, share your thoughts about FameLab uh, with us. Uh, the winner, that is uh, Katie, she is going to go on to Cheltenham Science Festival in June. And that means that she is going to compete at the UK um, or national level. Um, and the winner of the national final will then go through to compete at the international uh, final. So um, it's intense uh, from here on up. Uh, let me remind you uh, that you saw eight fantastic acts this evening. Uh, you, you saw uh, Paul um, with his shapes. You saw Golner with music um, as uh, for uh, health and learning. Uh, you saw Katie with uh, how to make a star in your kitchen. Um, you saw Elena um, with um, sperm companions. You saw Chloe with the sound of gravitational waves. You saw Madge um, and the mysteries of the immune system. Uh, you saw uh, Tom and the Matrix. Um, and you saw um, Sean um, with uh, the viral arms race and uh, mutations. So eight absolutely fantastic uh, performances. Well-deserved win from Katie there um, with her uh, fusion in the kitchen. Um, and thank you all competitors for all your hard work and uh, congratulations for getting this far or further. Thank you to the judges for again, your hard work and deliberation um, and paying a lot of attention and asking lots of tricky questions. Um, and thank you again to the History of Science Museum for making all of this happen. It has been a great journey. Um, I think we'll have everybody up now and we can wave goodbye and say thank you very much from the Oxfordshire uh, FameLab Regional Finals.